When I was a little girl, I loved Christmas. That's not a strange thing to say. Probably most of you loved Christmas. <laughs> um, that's me. And um, I had just gotten a new dress from my mom, a long dress that she sewed, and I was so excited about it. Um, I wanted you to see a picture of me excited about something because it's important to know that a couple years later, it was Christmas, and I was with my grandparents and my sibling, my brother, my sibling, that sounds weird, um, my brother, and we were um, opening presents and my cousin received a box. And he opened it and this box had um, seven books inside and along the back there was a knight who was fighting with a little child. <laughs> Now that I say that out loud, it sounds not so good. Um, and on the back, there was a sea serpent who was about to attack a ship. And on the other side was a door. And through the door tumbled four children, you see where this is going, perhaps, um, who had snow on their feet. And um, yes, I, he, he got the Chronicles of Narnia. So I, was, I sat there Christmas morning, thumbing through all the pages, looking at all the pictures, I was entranced. And so the next year for Christmas, I received that box. And every summer, I would read all the way through that series, all seven books. Except the second summer, I left off The Horse and His Boy, because that one just wasn't as exciting for me. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> so... Um, I would read it every summer, and I began to notice a pattern in me that every time Aslan showed up, I got so excited. In fact, because I read it every summer, like the moment before he showed up was my most exciting moment where I would be waiting for them to see him, for them to experience him. And it got to the point where all I did was read the Aslan parts. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I would go to the spot right before he came and read all of those in all the books. One of my favorite parts was when it was in Prince Caspian, and um, it was when Lucy, if you're familiar with the books, there's Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, the children, and they were back in Narnia, and Lucy saw Aslan. No one else did. Now, they were headed this way, and Aslan wanted them to go this way, and Lucy saw that, and she called it out. But nobody listened. And so they went to bed that night, and Aslan came to Lucy, and he said, you need to follow me, even if they don't. And she said, oh, great. So she went, and she tried to wake them all up and to tell them, we need to follow Aslan. And they were grumpy, but okay. And so they started to get up to go, and Susan threw a fit. She didn't want to go. She's like, she said really cruel things to Lucy. She was like, why are you making us do this? This is not, that's not the right way. It's, it's not safe. It's rocky. This is clearly a better direction. She was upset. But they went anyway. And as they were following Lucy, following Aslan, little bits of, of him would show up. They would see his mane, or they would see his tail, or they would see another part of him, and they started to go, oh, okay, I see you were right. <laughs> He's here. And finally, when they get to the destination, they were headed up the top of the hill or something like that, he turns around and faces them full, and they all are, oh, he's here. Except Susan. Her head is hanging. She's looking down. <laughs> She's ashamed. And Aslan speaks to each one of them. He invites each one of them forward. And when it comes to her turn, he says to her, My child, you have listened to your fears. Come and let me breathe on you. I was hooked. <laughs> I was hooked. So it wasn't long before Lewis so artfully introduced me to Jesus. And so when I began to read the Gospels, I began to see the same one there, obviously, because Lewis wrote Aslan because of Jesus. <laughs> and I began to see how much I loved him and how much I couldn't wait to read his appearing in the stories, to see his red words, his red letter words. <laughs> I, I don't know if you, anybody remember that <laughs> when you were a kid, the red letter edition. Um, and I would skip to the parts where he showed up 
which is not hard to do because the Gospels is mostly about him. But, um, <laughs> but I began to love this man who came and who turned everything upside down. He put the poor and the lowly on the top. He went to the people no one else would go to, and he forgave and he loved, and I was hooked. So I'm wondering this morning for you, how it is you come here today and how you see Jesus. And I want to invite you to just kind of settle into that for a second. Now, that was a really beautiful picture of how I see Jesus, but I want to let you know that there are parts of me that don't see him that way. <laughs> and there are parts of me that do some of these things I'm about to share with you. So one of the things that, that might have happened for you is someone in your life might have used the words of Jesus to hurt you. And I would be um, blind to think, or not wise to think, that there were some of you here who have been deeply hurt by the way people have used Jesus' words to tell you that you're not worth anything, that you don't belong, that you're not a part of this. And it might have led you to not want to follow him. I want to tell you, I'm right there with you. I've had that experience too. And um, I honor you in that place. Some of you might be here, and me, I'm together, <laughs> um, and you believed growing up that you had, even though you knew that he was this wonderful character, you believed that you had to be perfect in order to be loved. That you had to do everything right in order to be received and, and seen as a part of this group. It's very similar to the last one, actually. But, and so you also, you might have believed, if I do everything right, I'll be blessed. I'll have this, I'll have that, I'll have a great marriage, I'll have children who do exactly what I say and follow me. Okay, you didn't believe that probably. But um, you know what I'm saying, like, my life will go the way it needs to go if I am faithful to God and He will put His favor on me for how I behaved. And that's a heavy one. It's a heavy way to see Jesus, and I have that too. In fact, I'll talk about that in a little while. That happened to me Saturday morning. Then another way you might feel, and I feel this one too, is if my man is in office in the government, huh, I'm safe because he'll be following God the way I think he should. And um, he will change America and make it what it needs to be. Oh, by the way, both sides feel this way. I'm not picking on anyone. And you might have felt this urgency to, to, to work for that to work politically, to, to bring um, about change and what God wants to do through politics. And I just want to say I understand that one too, especially when I see people hurting and people in need. And I want the government to step forward and the world the way it is, John prayed about right now. But it's not there. He's not there either. So... I want to look at what the people of Israel thought about this Jesus on this day. And I want to invite you here with me. Now, recently I heard Professor Matthew Meyer Bolton, I had to read that because I can't remember that, speak about prophecy. He's a professor. And he said that it's like, well, prophecy was like having the prophets um, fashion a coat from the words of God. And that eventually would come the fulfillment of the prophecy and he would fill it out. He would put on the coat. And that the people, oh, that was probably not a good idea <laughs> with the cord. And that the people who were there at the time that it was being fulfilled, they would have seen themselves as actors almost in a play of this event. And they would step forward and rise forward and fulfill their part. I like that. I'm going to invite us to that today. And I'm going to tell you about how the people of Israel came to this spot. So we want to look at prophecy. So we're going to start with Zechariah 9, 9 through 12. And it says this. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coal, the fault, fold, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double." So he comes in riding on a donkey, humble, the king. And I want to just notice for you, or help you notice this section. He says, he shall speak peace to the nations. This is a hard one, and you'll understand why in a minute. Okay, the second one is from Psalm 118, and it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray. Hosanna. O oh Lord. O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. So if you were an, a Jewish person in this time when Jesus was here, you were standing in a very interesting time in history. It's widely believed, that from, <laughs> widely believed that from the last prophecy of Malachi to the first of John the Baptist was about 400 years or more-ish. <laughs> and during that time, the people of Israel were conquered by many peoples. And when they were conquered, their way of life was taken away from them. They were forced to live under the rules of the people who conquered them. And it was heavy. And um, for a brief period, they were able to rule themselves. And I wish I had time to tell you all about that. It's so cool. But the reality is that a lot of things came out of that time. Actually, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots came out of that time eventually, and because of what was happening in that time. So when we get to the time of Jesus, they have been under Roman occupation for quite some time. And it was difficult. And there were many zealots, actually, then, who would um, rebel and then be crucified and get squashed by the Romans, because the Romans were like, we can't have a rebellion against our rule. And so um, I, f I get this picture that maybe people were like, oh, could he be the Messiah? Oh, could he be the Messiah? Oh, could he be the Messiah? And for them, the Messiah meant he was going to come and restore their land to them, restore rule to them. He was going to bring back the Torah or the law into the land, and he would rebuild the temple and put it back into use the way that it was meant to be. And so they were looking for that. Some of them were looking for it non-militarily. Others were very interested in a military solution in a, in a battle. So into this picture comes Jesus. I want to give you a little bit of the context before this day of what was happening and coming from the book of John. And so in, in John chapter 9, I'll just say it really fast. Um, <laughs> there's so much to give you. Um, John chapter 9, Jesus healed a blind man. And at the end of that story, he tells the Pharisees that this blind man can truly see, but you don't see. And whoa, <laughs> that made them so mad. The next chapter was the story, he told the story of the Good Shepherd, which is what our sermon was the last time I shared with you guys, which I found that kind of interesting that that landed that way. He told them the story of the Good Shepherd, 
And he ended it with, I and the Father are one. And the Pharisees, again, oh. And they actually picked up stones to execute him right there. But he escaped. And he was with his disciples, resting, somewhere far away from there. And a man came and said to him, Lord, your friend Lazarus is dying. Please come right away. And so he packed his bags and he got up right away and he went and healed Lazarus. <laughs> right? No, that's not what happened. Do, you know, do, you, do you remember this story? That's not what happened. He stayed there for two days where he was. And in that time, Lazarus died. And then he said, it's time to go now. And the disciples said, well, I don't know if we want to go there. They've got stones, you know, they're, they're planning to stone you. It's not a good idea to head towards Jerusalem. But you guys, that's where Jesus has been heading for so long, was to Jerusalem. This is where he was meant to go. So he gets up and he goes and he gets to the place and um, Martha comes to him, Lazarus' sister, and says, where were you? What, this, he died and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. And then Mary comes to him and she's crying and, and undone. And she says, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus looks at her and his heart is moved. And he says, Mary, where did they lay him? And so he went with Mary to the tomb and he wept in front of it. And then he said, push away the stone. And so they pushed away the stone and he stood in the opening and he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And you guys, I wish that you could see this story as if you were seeing it for the first time. Can you imagine? Kind of like the Aslan, the piece where he shows up. Like, Lazarus literally walked out. He walked out of this tomb and was alive. He had been dead and he was alive. I'm imagining that the people, the crowd that was standing there thought, oh, could this be the Messiah? Oh, he's got the power over death. So he could totally overthrow the Romans. I think this is the guy. And so they followed him for the next couple of days, wherever he went. They ended up back at um, Lazarus' house for a meal, um, and they, the crowd followed there, and then the crowd headed on into Jerusalem for the Passover. And that leads us to where our story is. So we're going to look here at John chapter 12, 12 to 25. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that there you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I imagine that um, after seeing him come in in glory on a donkey, hearing that sentence might have been a little bit deflating. Uh, oh, we have to die? I thought you were going to keep us from dying. 
I thought you were going to come in and set up your rule and get the Romans out of here and get everything all set up so that we don't have to die. And Jesus said, no, I'm, I'm leading the way to the death. This is hard to understand. This is hard to connect with. I I feel so much mercy in my heart for myself and for the crowd in this story. The story goes that this crowd, next week we'll find out, takes off and leaves him or calls for his death. They switch on him. And I understand where that comes from. I understand when you're looking for Messiah, Messiah, Messiah to get you out of the pain of this world, how frustrating it must be when he says we need to go towards the pain. I feel for them and the sadness that that must have brought, the fear, the anxiety, the anger. On Saturday, I was working on this sermon and I have got to tell you, I struggled with it. Um, It took a lot of energy for me, and I found that what was happening was I was getting kind of confused and having a hard time putting things together and getting my outline done. And whenever I sat down to work on it, I would get really sleepy. (laughs) That's how I feel with taxes, too. We got to do our taxes. (laughs) Um, Okay, so anyway, um, I was getting really sleepy. And for me, that is a big signal that there's something underneath that's running the show that I'm not aware of in my life. And so I stood up and I went, I was supposed to have my time with Benjamin. My husband's name is Benjamin and every Saturday we have time, he spends time focusing on my, kind of what's going on for me and on Sundays after I get back from here, I spend time focusing on what's going on for him. And we dive into what's going on and under the surface for us in our life. And so I immediately stood up. I don't always do this. Sometimes it's like a week of being sleepy <laughs> um, or more. But I got up and I said, we've got to go, go to this because I cannot finish the sermon. And he said, okay. And what we discovered was that I had this fear from very early on in my childhood that I might disappoint you. That if I messed up or said something wrong or said something that was uncomfortable or that you didn't agree with, that you might reject me. That I wouldn't be loved. I was afraid that I have to be perfect to be loved. And I was thinking about this after we worked on it. We spent a lot of time, a couple things I want to tell you about this that that connect back to Aslan. Benjamin could see that I was really, really disrupted by this idea. My, my, My emotions and everything kept trying to come away from it. Oh, I can't, I can't look at that. Let's do something else. And he very kindly walked me back towards it. This idea that I was believing at the core of my being that I need to be perfect to be loved. And when I would get overwhelmed, he would come and bring his face really close to me so that I knew I was not alone in that moment. And um, I want to tell you about why that's important for what we're talking about. Why it's important to die, because that day we saw that something needs to die here. That there's something in me that needs to be destroyed so that I can rise again and love. Because what's really interesting about the belief that I need to be perfect to be loved is that I can't love you when I feel that way. I can't even love me when I feel that way. And I start to protect myself from the world. I start to close myself in or I start to perform harder or I start to isolate. And I can't be connected with you. As a therapist, one of the things we, I learned kind of early on was this idea that in our nervous systems, we're wired from birth to connect, to go hard after relationship 
and we're wired to protect. It's a really great system if a lion is coming after you. Um, you don't really want to, if a lion's chasing you, you don't really want to stop and say, hey, John, how are you feeling about last week's sermon? So good to talk to you. You, you know, you can't do that. You have to run or you have to fight or you have to flight. <laughs> or for, no, flight, flight is run. You have to run or sleep or whatever the nervous system responses are. Connection and protection cannot happen simultaneously. And this is the kicker. As humans, when we feel threat, protection always trumps connection. It always hops right on top and pushes connection out the door. So if I'm eternally afraid, not eternally, but if I am always afraid that if I am not perfect, I'm not loved, I'm under threat. And then my experience with you is that I'm not loving you. I'm using you maybe. I might be using you to feel better. I might be telling you um, all these wonderful things to make you like me, but that's not really connection, right? I might be isolating. I might be like, oh, I can't go see anyone. <laughs> I just need to stay here and be alone. And so there's this, that belief inside of me is like a, it's like a, I feel like it's like a vine that just goes around your heart and it has to be destroyed. <laughs> It has to be burned, sometimes gently, sometimes violently. And we has to be let go. We have to let go of it. And it's hard because I'm scared. I was scared Saturday morning, and it was running the show for me. I'm scared of death, too. <laughs> Imagine you are, too. So this is the interesting thing. There's another thing they talk about in the research, and that is that when we feel that way, emo certain emotions that are hard for us, we have a very small window of tolerance for them. For me, that's if someone's angry or I'm in trouble. I have a very small window of tolerance for that feeling. For you, it might be different. And so whenever I'm in the presence of that, I bring everything really small and tight and my protections come out, and I can't love. I'm stuck here. And I was thinking about it, and I was thinking about this king who rode in on a donkey, what his window of tolerance is like for difficult emotions. It's wide. It's very, very wide. And I realized one day that that is not just emotions, that's his mercy. His mercy is this wide. Mine is this wide. And what he does is he works on me to let go so that my window of tolerance will widen like his. He's bringing the kingdom of love. This is not a um, happy, happy, joy, joy, sweet, sweet feeling love. This is love. This is my husband staying with me when I'm pushing him away and saying, I'm staying with you in this hour, even though it's getting hard because you're saying some things that are kind of hard for me. Or, um, or, or committing to love someone and let our window of tolerance widen, our mercy widen. That's the work that's happening. And this is the beautiful thing, you guys. That Aslan is just like with Susan. He's looking at you and he says, you, you, I, I always expect to get in trouble with him. But what I see when I look at him is Angie. You've listened to your fears. Come and let me breathe on you. Let me breathe my spirit into you. That's the best. <laughs> That's the most amazing. And I've got to tell you when I've experienced that, whether it's from some of, some of you or from Benjamin or from my children. Oh my goodness, my children. You guys, if you want to believe you're perfect, don't have children <laughs> because they are going to see you every day of your life and they are going to say, hey, I don't like this. And listen, if your deepest belief is I will not be loved if I'm not perfect, when they say that, you're going to want to push them away. You're going to want to not engage that. You might go, don't talk to me like that. Or you might say, oh, 
I feel so much shame. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and push them away. But if you can hear it, it is the greatest gift to your life. Mine have been to me. They've helped me to learn this lesson. I'm still learning it about anger, about my fear of anger and what it's done to them. <sighs> so I want to invite you to the table. And um, I want to take a drink because I'm going to share something with you, and I'm not sure I can do it if I don't drink something. There's a song by um, Rich Mullins, back from the 80s. <laughs> and um, I love it. And, it, and it goes something like this. There's a wideness in God's mercy I cannot find in my own. And it keeps his fire burning to melt this heart of stone. Keeps me aching with a yearning. Keeps me glad to have been caught in the reckless raging fury that they call the love of God. Now I've seen no band of angels, but I've heard the soldier's song. Love hangs over them like a banner. Love within them leads them on to the battle, on the journey. And it's never gonna stop, ever widening their mercy and the fury of his love. Joy and sorrow are this ocean, and in their every ebb and flow, now the Lord, a door has opened, a door hell could never close. Here I'm tested and made worthy, tossed about but lifted up in the reckless raging fury that they call the love of God. So, on the night he was betrayed, the merciful one took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And I want to invite you to come forward today and if you're willing to bring your palm frond. I hope you got one when you came in. <laughs> um, and I was going to say something about like change the way you see it or whatever, but I, I don't know. I think just if you want to bring your palm frond and offer it up here and realize that the play that they were enacting was real and true, even if their hearts weren't ready for it yet. And the beautiful thing about the merciful one is that he's willing to wait for our hearts to be ready for his love. The brown cups are wine, the blue cups are juice. So come on forward. So um, this kingdom of love, it's not just for one group. I think that's part of where they got stuck. It's for everyone. That's also why it's so hard. It's really hard to open our heart to everyone. So I said I didn't like the horse and his boy, but um, I do now. And um, I want to read you as a benediction what Aslan said to Shasta, you may not remember because you may have skipped it too. <laughs> um, what Aslan said to Shasta at the very end when he met him. Um, if you remember the story, Shasta was this little orphan boy who, um, who was taken out of a boat by an awful man who raised him. And he escaped with a Narnian horse to try to get back to Narnia. And it's the whole story of his escapades. And all throughout, there's lions that are doing dangerous things, and he's really scared of them. And um, then he meets Aslan. And this is what Aslan says, and this is your benediction. There was only one lion. 
I was the lion who forced you to join a ravis. That's the girl that he traveled with. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horse, horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you could reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death so that it came to the shore where a man sat wakeful at midnight to receive you. You can trust him. Blessings on you. I hope you have a good Palm Sunday. <laughs>